ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you from far away Germany. Would have been much nicer to join you there in, in Korea, but I hope we meet next year for the next Markbook conference. I'm particularly happy uh, for this invitation to this educational workshop. And uh, the talk is entitled Polymers for Applications. And I try to put it in the perspective from a long way from an idea and work in the academic lab towards potentially a product. So what we want to cover today is really going from a research idea and the objective and I tell you basically from my own experience and how we then go in a number of steps towards an application. Of course an application is always the aim or very often an aim these days. However if you open a journal you have all those reports and you could think that the solution to a problem is really there. Now COVID times taught us that certain development can be accelerated, can be very fast, but certainly to have a medical product approved. In this case, what we will discuss with polymers is of course a very complicated, long um, journey that you have to undertake with a lot of things that you don't foresee if you come naively as we enter that business um, from the scientific level. Now, to start this, uh, we can look at the so-called technology readiness levels. Those are listed, originally came from the NASA. You have, for instance, in Europe, a particular type of um, definitions that classify how far a technology has been advanced. And if you look here, you can go from basic principles that are observed to technology that is being formulated. Yeah, you prove that in the lab, and the question is really how far you get in that chain. And it's actually a bit frustrating in the end to see how long the way is until TRL9, where you actually have then the system proven, and you could say you're ready for liftoff. Now, our problem was motivated by a particular problem in the medical field. And if you look at burn wounds, that could be second degree burns, skulls, uh, very prevalent in, in children when they start to explore their environment, um, you sometimes have these nasty looking wounds as you see here. Now there's very well advanced uh, wound dressings for that. You see that in this picture over here, where those violet dots are actually the glue to tuck that down. And for some of those products that are commercially available, the skin will heal without any scarring. This is very much advanced. However, you could catch under such a wound dressing an infection. And there's no way to remove the dressing and put it back on for the full function. Of course, if there's a suspicion that there could be a bacterial infection developing, th this thing has to be taken off. Now, it's difficult to actually diagnose under this wound dressing. And inflammation and infection show similar th symptoms. So rapid result is actually required. And that was the motivation for a project we we'll try to address how to detect this implemented in the wound dressing, targeting pathogenic bacteria that are known to be present in those wounds. So for instance, Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So the actual thing is about diagnosis. However, the principle should also be applicable to detection. Now the idea is to develop then an infection signaling functional wound dressing. So that, as you see here, you have, well, in this, this fake image a wound dressing no? under white light illumination it looks like a normal wound dressing however you could detect with a responsive indicator inside the dressing whether or not infection is present so in this uv illumination clearly you see here a dye lights up um, and if you have that signaling so the dye lighting up coupled to the presence of bacteria in an infectious state then you would have this triggered signal but only if pathogenic bacteria are present now this is in principle to design a system very complex because the basic principle is simple. However, infection is not the presence of bacteria. We have up to one, two kilograms of bacteria in and on us, but we're not uh, sick, yeah? we're not uh, ill. So pathogenic bacteria, even if they may be present, even if it's um, uh, like MRSA resistant bacteria, they don't necessarily make you unhealthy. So to the threshold to infection, those have to be signaled. And in principle, the same principle could be taken for therapy if you have some type of release that is triggered. Now, in this project that was called Bacteria Safe, we ventured into developing infection signaling capsules in order to fulfill that function in the wound dressing. So the reason why a small capsule is beneficial here is once a capsule is opened, it will release rapidly due to diffusion its interior. And it's well known how to produce capsules, either on a lipid route or using polymers like we pursued. 
And so the idea is to use actually molecules that bacteria produce and secrete to open up those capsules. If this is a selective process, as you see here, those enzymes or uh, uh, toxins or virulence factors secreted by the bacteria, if they destabilize the wall or maybe digest the wall, in the case of an enzyme, this wall would open up. And uh, dye molecules you may have inside can diffuse out. And that goes very rapidly if those are small capsules with sizes on the order of 100 to 200 nanometers in diameter. So you can imagine light on if you have a highly concentrated dye inside the vesicles that is then released and lights up because it is diluted. Vice versa, one can also, as we have shown, use a light off uh, uh, modality to signal, yes, this capsule is open, and to couple this to the presence of a particular concentration of bacteria. Now, then as a chemist, you go to the lab, you have a clear motivation, and you try to find a suitable target. And that with the motivation to bring it towards application. Initially, completely naive. Of course, scientifically, fully valid. And we targeted hyaluronic acid block copolymers because it is known that most strains of Staphylococcus aureus, which is present in infected wounds, produce pronounced levels of an enzyme called hyaluronidase. So that enzyme digests hyaluronic acid. So if that is part of a block copolymer comprising the capsule, that should lead to this opening. Now a target structure you see here, and as this is in science, you can design molecules, you can synthesize them, prove that you have them, and maybe fulfill a function, yeah, which is really on the idea to maybe lab type very early TNR. And that molecule already looks a little bit complicated. Now you can make several types of molecules that are first on this planet. That's scientifically good, and you show some function. Now to synthesize this, you rely typically on chemistry that someone else has discovered, and here we uh, utilize chemistry from the Le Commandou lab in, in Bordeaux, who managed to end functionalized hyaluronic acid with a triple bond. And then we did a ring opening polymerization of lactic acid in that case, but it also works with uh, poly epsilon caprolactone, and then did an end functionalization to introduce here at the end uh, the azide group. And then you click this together. That is, in terms of chemistry, beautiful. Of course, making block copolymers typically you do in a sequential manner, either by yeah, uh, anionic classic routes. These days you do this with uh, control radical approaches. However, that also could work. The problem here is actually to prove um, the structure block copolymers assemble in particular type of structures because you have blocks that are usually sometimes incompatible. You, know, you have to utilize this, this immiscibility. So they're very difficult to characterize. So if you click that together, that's highly specific and selective. We reasoned that should be a way forward. Okay, then we have those capsules. We can load them and look at the behavior. And what you see here is, I go very rapidly over this, is essentially that, that polymer. No? We see here the link from the click chemistry, and then we see here certain cleavage sites um, for different types of enzymes. Okay, You see that we get capsules. This is the electron microscopy, and if you look at incorporated fluorescein, you see the release after addition of an enzyme. Now, in that case here, it was an enzyme that this level is the other block, the other protein SK. But you see the demonstration of the effect of light. So that can be in principle used. Now, we looked at various of those, uh, of those polymers, different block lengths, different polyester, and then you do all your nice scientific studies. Now, if you want to apply comes a lot of problems. A lot of problems because it is no longer the work in the lab. Um, I may actually tell you if you do those types of tests with actual bacteria, with bacterial suspensions, you come as a chemist to a microbiology environment. And the first thing that we discovered very early on in the project is that actually we do not work sterile. Yeah, our polymers were not sterile and we essentially messed up the first experiment. Things we have to consider, and this is a long list now that becomes even longer if you go into detailed steps, you have to prove that your material is safe. So you have to look at cytotoxicity tests. So these are standardized tests with cell lines where you see at particular concentrations of your vesicles, the constituents, but also those degradation products after a capsule has been opened, that those molecules are safe to use with cells. It becomes more complex to look at endotoxins. This would be some, some 
hidden, uh, essentially uh, dangerous molecules in there, we also have to be able to sterilize this. Now, how do you sterilize a block core polymer? This is something a chemist normally does not consider. However, for those applications, it is necessary. And then you scratch your head, even though that could be safe to use, you can sterilize it. Are you allowed to use it? If you think about wound dressing, you bring molecules. Even if you only integrate these molecules that you synthesize into a known wound dressing into contact with patient. So you need to have FDA approval for this. And it starts, well, are your materials FDA approved? Well, in our case, most likely not. So we would have to go through a lengthy test. I leave that now to the side because certainly this would be a big hurdle to overcome if you want to apply that particular type of molecules I've shown you. Then is the question of upscaling. And here, of course, it goes from green to orange. I mean, we can say actually it goes to red because the synthesis I've shown you, you cannot upscale. And then is the question, obviously, if you try to develop interesting materials, interesting molecules, interesting systems for particular types of applications, is really the question, is this now a real interest to, to get that technology working? If so, you would think about upscaling right in the beginning and discard anything you cannot upscale. On the other hand, if you do the other way like we did, you start this academic way, you may end up in a dead end where actually upscaling is a big issue. Certainly, if you can do that, with a different approach, you have to worry about IP protection. Do you have novel materials? Well, that would be good. Or novel approach, no? like a capsule that has this reporter function no, that you cannot patent, as it turned out in our case. Also, the polymers. There are precedents of similar polymers, and you have patents that actually, well, it is not innovative enough. Can you patent anything? And for us, in that quest here, we had already a red line and we stopped. Now, suppose you go over this and you're able to upscale, you're able to probably get a FDA approval at some point and have IP protection secured. There's certain other things. In this FDA approval and um, uh, biomedical device classification approval, you have to work according to good manufacturing practice. You have to sketch all the processes. This is something what is not typically done. Yeah? And I just give you here the link to read about this, what this is, and typically this cannot be done by academic labs in the university. And then you come to regulatory affairs. Again, to be able to use materials, you need approval for those. I hinted to the FDA approval. And you first have to classify that as a biomedical device and seek approval. So GMP production and documentation is part of that lengthy process. Again, you see here this would be something if you download the lecture material where you can go to the offline resources. Okay, now we had a very complicated case. The talk would be over here if there was not a simpler uh, way. And the simpler way would be to look at FDA approved materials, to look at some simpler system. And the simpler system you see here are block core polymers that are actually not novel as polymers. Um, they are now polyethylene glycol, uh, poly epsilon caprolactone, and um, the caprolactone can be degraded by an enzyme called lipase. And many staphylococci produce lipase. So that would be something that can be synthesized. And you rely on established chemistry. This is work here uh, that we followed uh, uh, from Jan Fein, who, whom I met when I was a PhD student at the University of Twente. And they developed those tin uh, octoate catalyzed ring opening polymerizations. And that's very handy to produce you know, according to approved manners block polymers of that sort, where we have now an enzyme labeled bond, the ester bond in the hydrophobic block. And you can also then show that you can make those materials, you get capsules, either by the AFM data you see on the left-hand side, yeah, those large bits here are, um, are, are those capsules. You see here, it goes up to 70 nanometers, they flatten out a little bit. And you see in the confocal microscope here on the right-hand side where we have labeled um, actually the hydrophobic wall with a dye called Nile Red, and I'll show you the structure on the next slide, um, that you can get on a support of uh, those capsules lighting up. And you see in the dynamic light scattering that the hydrodynamic radius for several batches is here around 100 nanometers. So pretty nice distribution. Now we can make those materials. We can encapsulate using the solvent shift method, classic approaches. Um, dye molecules, yeah, and the Nile red is actually not incorporated inside that polymerosome, that vesicle, but it's in the wall. 
But if we degrade that wall, you see in the next slide, you can actually look at a light uh, off effect because that dye only fluoresces if it's sitting in a hydrophobic environment. You see here data. Now the structure of Nile red you see up here. This is simply mixed into your preparation. And you see um, the fluorescence spectra. You have an excitation at 510 nanometers. And you see the initial spectra here. And those curves go down, down, down. The longer you follow the enzymatic reaction. No? It's an enzymatic reaction with lipase. And you see a light off because the dye, as the wall is being degraded, is no longer sitting in this hydrophobic environment. Now those kinetics look well behaved but we want to look more at applications so like this investigation from an academic point of view is interesting to understand the process however one has to see this and one has to see this preferably by bare eye and you see here a suspension left is the blank that would be before adding the enzyme and after having added the enzyme you clearly see that solution is no longer colored yeah the solution is not really very much turbid that means the uh, vesicle concentration is not too high and as it's degraded, the color goes away. Obviously, for signaling, to have no signal and then the light go on, as we had with the dequenching, a light up probes is much better. What we focused on here is, however, that light off. For practical reasons, you know, because um, you also have to consider the properties of capsules made by those not tailor-made materials. Well, they're tailor-made to some extent, but um, if we look at the actual chemistry, you know, these are pretty much benign and, and known polymeric systems that are now then adapted to that application. Now this is neat enzyme. Neat enzyme in a buffered solution is way far from anything that is an application, I should say. Let's go to bacteria supernatant. Bacteria supernatant is you grow bacteria, you remove the bacteria and you take th that liquid, uh, the so-called supernatant. No? Sometimes these enzymes may degrade, so um, the concentration is not as high as in the vicinity of bacteria, but um, it is first easier to use. You don't rely on biological labs necessarily. And then also you have less problems with light scattering. So, if we look now at this busy slide here, we have normalized intensity versus time. And the traces are in green, esterase, is an enzyme that should not attack the PCL. Then we have the lipase, the enzyme, that is known to attack, and you see that it goes very rapidly. And then we have two different strains of Staphylococcus. You see here one with the accessory gene regulator on. That's the active form, and you see here over a time scale, I'll say 20 minutes, intensity drops. So that means the enzyme that was produced by the bacteria is now in the supernatant, degrades the PCL wall of our capsules, and we see that the dye that is in the capsule wall ceases to fluoresce. So we see at the same time time scale, we see selectivity, no? but we have a proof that this is actually working with real bacteria derived um, enzymes. That's a big step, and everyone was happy. However, the application is a wound dressing. And a wound dressing is a non woven material. Yeah? There are established approaches. You also have specialized wound dressings that are made of hydrogels. Yeah, that is still. A large step. We have one element here, the sensing entities that would be our nanocapsules, but they have to be somehow implemented in that system. Okay. Now if we take one step back, we look at the design, um, we can certainly vary the structure a little bit, keeping this um, ethylene glycol block and varying the polyester and thereby introduce a certain level of selectivity polylactic acid is susceptible to proteinases and lipases as we've seen already degrades the polyepsilon caprolactone and those things can made can be made with FDA approved materials no? certainly if you want to have that uh, approved as a biomedical device you have to test it however um, the hurdle is much much more big problem is now technological implication implementation how do we go about bringing this into a wound dressing and of course, everything you do in the lab is focused to the problem. And I have to be honest, we did not really think about how to implement that initially. Now that was then part of a larger grant project application and those things were considered up front. Yeah? But to do it in the end, you had to develop approaches. And among different
different approaches is, for instance, spray coating. And we could show that intact vesicles can be spray coated. You see here AVM images of individual vesicles on a support. You may also immobilize them with electrostatic interactions. You see here a patterned um, array. It's not very nice. Uh, it's quite some years old. Optical microscopy, scanning electron microscopy. And if you zoom in by opposite charges, we had a positively charged surface and negatively charged vesicles. They can be absorbed on the surface. And so how this was implemented in a prototype system is essentially to use an inkjet printer to dispense um, a vesicle containing solution. This comes onto a plasma activated uh, non woven. The non woven in that case is poly poly uh, polypropylene. You see here uh, where the plasma is being applied, no? and then there's a commercial inkjet printer bringing down our material. Yeah? And you see here those fibers, it's a PP non woven, it's a standard material. Beforehand, you don't see any fluorescence, and after the treatment, you see fluorescence. So that means the dye that is incorporated in the wall of a vesicle is actually on there. And you can also show in a lab-type experiment that this works. It's a validation. If we look at various samples here, before incubation with white light, you see nothing. Before incubation, you see those are pink. No, that's the non red. And after uh, three hours of incubation in solution of uh, uh, proxenase K, you see that this color is gone. This is under UV irradiation before and after, and in between we just took every half hour uh, a picture, not to photo bleach the dye. So that means here we have this entire way to a small scale production from roll to roll, but half of the problem is missing. Yeah? Well, we don't have approval uh, for a biomedical device. No? Um, I cannot really tell you what the status here is in terms of patenting, but I. This is something that is essentially ongoing work, yeah? and it takes years. So whenever you read something is revolutionizing the world tomorrow, I would be very skeptical, because sometimes that actually works, but it requires actually carrying this from academia, in my opinion, to giving this to specialists in the current way of thinking. Okay. We have worked, and I should also mention this, on a separate approach, going simple, simple is better, to take a wound dressing material that also is approved. Yeah? Uh, Kytosan is also um, anti, um, antibacterial to some extent and essentially implement a colorimetric function. And that can be done by um, conjugating chromogenic or fluorogenic substrates. Those are molecules that possess certain enzyme labor bonds and a liberated dye changes either its spectrum or it lights up. And that can be demonstrated that this is a very efficient way of equipping known wound dressing materials with the color function. We see one example here. This picture is not great. It's in a cuvette before and after adding enzyme. You see here a prototype on a polymer backing with essentially patterned uh, dots. Yeah, and we have a covalent attachment of those fluorogenic substrates. You see here uh, a particular uh, linkage is a stable amide linkage. Yeah? You see a sugar ring and you see a molecule that is familiar to you. This is a precursor for indigo. Huh? And as this is being cleaved off yeah, and you have a dimerization in the presence of oxygen, you form indigo. And that blue is basically what you have in blue genes, not water soluble, will not leach. It is sitting there. And you can detect certain enzymes. This is very attractive, I should say. And you can bring that if you use not uh, chromogenic but um, uh, fluorogenic substrates to uh, detection limits for the enzyme way below a nanomolar concentration. So this is very good. What can also be done, no, and this is now going more to more recent work, more academic, but clearly pointing which way this could go in terms of application, is to implement different types of substrates and bring this then in a way of parallel screening also to a selective detection. So that if you have a panel of pathogenic bacteria, you want to differentiate that with a clever set of fluorogenic and chromogenic substrates and different colors, different locations or um, shaped spots that you can differentiate this. And you see here, it's essentially the same idea. We have um, a chitosan derived n succinidyl a derivative that can be functionalized with different types of uh, substrates, and those substrates are susceptible to different types of enzymes. So you do a screening, and this can, for instance, allowing you to differentiate the Staphylococcus aureus, different strains from EHEC for 
that is a, a S3, a very um, a dangerous um, E. coli type from a harmless E. coli type. And so you see that in different areas you have different reactions or different colors developing. So that is something that we have established now. Um, obviously, all those steps have to be brought if you want to bring this into contact with a patient um, that I've mentioned briefly before. It is easier if you take a sample, and many of us are now familiar with those uh, rapid tests, no? uh, COVID antigen tests, where you take a, a swab. If you take a swab, you of course do not have to get approval for patient contact, but still, if you want to use this in, in an application, you have to get approval by the authorities. And that takes a long step, and by no means I claim that we have done those steps. This is on the far end, and I can tell you in a second why I believe this is still the case. You can also then bring this to more simplified systems, and again going from complicated way to prove the idea to simplified systems is to do this on a chitosan coated paper for a, a, a point of contact um, um, type of sensor, now where you have color developing, and the question is how do you detect color? We've seen we can detect it by bare eye, but we also know that people may be colorblind, may have different um, um, differentiation power, huh? and you can do this in a more um, kind of objective way using, for instance, smartphone camera. And as we've shown very recently, that type of sensing approach on a paper-based sensor uh, brings surprising uh, detection limits for the enzymes that we try to detect, and thereby for bacteria we try to detect. Uh, in an automated fashion where you utilize the technology that's, that's inside a smartphone with, I should also say, clever kinetic analysis. And that was uh, invented by, by Sergei. Okay. Then, in the end, what I think I've shown you, that a reasonable target, a reasonable aim for the development of a particular type of polymer could be a functional wound dressing, where you have a reporting function not necessarily helping uh, only burn children, but that is only present in terms of also uh, chronic wounds where you need to know the status. And to equip functional polymer, either by filling this with reporter capsules or taking the existing wound dressing material by a polymer analogous reaction, and then trying to implement a function that if we have enzymes present or different virulence factors, no, that could also be toxins, that give a selective reaction that you then have here sensory function and that thing then lights up. And we like to call this sensor materials because the function is built into the material. And if this is visible for instance by bare eye or more objectively with a smartphone, you can also consider to have this in a very um, simple and widespread application. Obviously one has to go through all those necessary details, tests and approvals. Now, and if we see that, one can see then if we have a wound dressing, let's see yet another test to show. Now yeah, we can see three different types of enzymes in an actual wound dressing. This is here in that case a woven material that has been chosen as a base to carry that function. It was coated with, uh, with chitosan. Now with this in a tour de force, I've tried to show you that we have the successful demonstration of novel uh, polymeric sensor materials for detection of bacterial infections. Beyond TRL5, when you probably need specialized external partners. That's from the approach that we have approached this as chemists with some teammates that come from microbiology. And then we say at that stage, for me at least, and that's my personal conclusion, translation remains very challenging. And the question is, to some extent, why that is? And we are trained in a particular scientific discipline and the rest is learning by doing. I think what it requires are new approaches to a more holistic training and education so that you break, to some extent break traditional boundaries or disciplines. You have training in very specialized areas and you neglect certain things. Obviously if you're trained as a chemist, as a physicist or mathematician you have your area of specialization. However, if you look here we combine chemistry, polymer chemistry, no, physical chemistry in terms of characterization and microbiology. And the way we try to address this now, and that is more or less of an experiment, is in a uh, um, European research training network called Stimulus, where we aim at stimulus responsive materials for rapid detection and treatment of healthcare associated infections to treat 
essentially this in a more holistic manner so that PhD students not only work on their research but they also get the education that is necessary in terms of IP, IP protection, regulatory affairs and what does it take to bring your material, your approaches through approval so that in the end those people have the knowledge to be able to cover this from A to Z. Now, with that advertisement I would like to stop but not before thanking the people who have been involved in this now you see a summer school 2019. Those were slightly more happy days where we could still go on a summer school. We have high hope we can do that again next year. And um, you see the people from my lab uh, who contributed to the work I've shown here. We have great collaboration with uh, Toby Jenkins for more than 20 years. We worked together at Bath and um, would also motivate you to follow up that link here to, to his approach. He does similar things with liposomes and um, commercially available pH responsive polymer films and the prototype was constructed by David Cameron who was at that time at LUT in Finland. We of course have funding from various funding organizations and with that I'm at the end. I would like to thank you for your kind attention and I would be happy to answer any questions that come up long. Thank you.